Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's uh, Damien. I apologise for my slightly husky voice. It's an occupational hazard of working with children in busy emergency departments. Um, I'm never sure whether you're meant to give conflicts of interest for these types of talk, but I'm going to use my particular conflict of in uh, interest to uh, lead into some of the themes uh, of this presentation. Um, and I've developed a very bespoke scoring system for use in urgent and emergency care. And it's called the POP score, which is the Paediatric Observation Priority Score. There is nothing clever or special about this. It is a list of numbers which have some credibility. You add those numbers together and it gives you a general risk of illness. Um, and it has been pretty well validated and I've got a couple of publications. I don't really care about that, to be honest. What I was really interested in is that I did this piece of work because we'd had a number of occasions in our emergency department when children had presented um, and they'd been recognised as being ill, that wasn't the problem, but the communication between staff about how ill they were or our communication in the emergency department to other areas of the hospital was quite frankly woeful. And what I wanted to do was create a language and a way of speaking so that people could um, have, a, 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 I suppose, a, a common dialect about the ill child. The really unexpected thing that came out of this is it became increasingly obvious to me that lots and lots and lots of children actually had no physiological derangement and were very well, but some of those were being admitted. Um, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about the paradigm of spotting the sick child. And I wonder, I just wonder, and this is my challenge to you as an audience, is if we've got that paradigm wrong. Because actually the majority of children, the majority of children presenting either to a family practitioner or an emergency department will be well and can be discharged without any treatment and will not come to harm. So should we be better at spotting the well child? So I, my, I have two daughters, one of them is six years old, one of them is four years old and I've been teaching them to play Guess Who? Um, and Guess Who is a game where you kind of find a face and you describe the features of the face and you try and spot the, the, the other character that your opponent has. And I spent a long time explaining to Isla how this game works and how you had to work through a sequence of recognition features. Do, do you have brown hair? Do you have blue eyes? Are you male or female? And I thought I'd done it really well and I sat down and I asked my question and then I does your character have brown eyes? And Isla said no. Then Isla looked at me and says, is it Anne? And that was her first question. And yes, my card was Anne. She guessed it on the first go. And I went, well, Isla, the game doesn't work like that. And she ran off to tell her sister how amazing she was. And I've ne I can't play this game with her anymore because in her head, she succeeded at it instantly and she made that presumptive guess. Now, how often in your practice when you're seeing ill children, do you remember the cases where the really sick child stands out? That you have it fixed in your head what the key criteria for illness are. And you can't move away from that. And I'm going to show you some pictures which I hope demonstrate that. So, in this Christmas theme picture is a panda. Hands up when you've seen the panda. Ah, oh, look at that. That's strong work. Two people have seen the panda. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so we've got a couple of people who have seen the panda. Okay. So once you've seen the panda, you can't unsee it. Okay, if I go back a slide, okay, it's really difficult to look at that and you, you're gonna see the panda first time, but there's lots of you who just didn't see it to begin with. There's the panda. Okay, so that's not really healthcare. I'm not teaching you anything, any medical practice. Okay, so I want you to spot sepsis, vertically, horizontally, or diagonally. Put your hands up when you've seen sepsis. Clustering of hands, clustering. Okay, so we've had about 10 hands up. Okay, so there's sepsis. Now my question to you is, did you find sepsis because you looked for the first letter of sepsis and then looked for an E to work out because there's no other way you can spell sepsis because you've got an S and an E? 
Or did you do it the other way around? Okay, I'll work backwards. Sepsis has to have an I and an S in it. And you might think, well, okay, Dr. Rowlands, where are you going with this? Yeah, I haven't come to a major international conference to be shown word searches and crossword puzzles. Well, the, the key thing is, is that I, I have a lot of junior doctors come up to me and they'll go, Dr. Rowland, and I'll say, Damien, and they'll go, Dr. Rowland, I've seen this patient, um, and I think they've got sepsis and I'm going to give them antibiotics. And I go, why is that? And they go, well, they've had a fever for a long time, mum thinks they're really unwell, um, and they just don't look right. Um, and I go and see the child, and the child is running around the department eating a packet of crisps, and is completely well. And there is absolutely no way in a world that this child has sepsis. And the key thing is, is that the junior doctor's not wrong, that they've picked up some features that they know are associated with sepsis. But they started at the IS end, because I know you, there are very, very few children who look really well and have severe sepsis. So that is the first marker, is your kind of your gut feeling, your gestalt. And then you can work through all the other stuff. Okay? There's no point in going backwards because you're wasting time with things that you don't need. So this is the problem. Oh. oh, sorry, okay, I've been asked to move. Apologies. Um, so we, the challenge that we all face is spotting the sick child. Okay, so there's no sound to this, but that child has severe stridor, and, and I don't need to be an, an expert, and even a member of the public would recognise that child as being unwell. And you don't need to be a medical professional to work out that this child is well. Now I appreciate I'm not giving you any history, I appreciate I'm not giving you any background, I appreciate I'm not giving you any physiology. But there are some features there that make you think that the child's quite well, it looks active, it looks alert. There are some soft features, a bit of mild, maybe respiratory distress, there's some kind of subcostal attractions. And so you're not sure and you think you want to go on. So there is a grey area between the extremes of well and unwell. And this presents us a real problem. So this is really old data. I apologise for that, but this is a great study. And it's still valid today, even in the post-immunisation era. This is from a children's assessment unit. So these are children referred by GPs, and the GPs think that they might be unwell. And this is a, a lot of children who have, um, may have had kind of serious or kind of non-serious disease. Let's pick the minor infection. So the minor infection, 339 children, you will see all of them had some derangement and 40% of them had a tachycardia or a tachypnea, but all of them would have gone back to being well uh, if we'd have done nothing at all. And then this has been followed up by another, and I think this is a brilliant study using big data, and it's an American study of a, a big pediatric emergency department. Um, and what they looked is they had 40,000 patients, 40,000 patients, um, and that 6,000 of them met SIRS criteria. Now, I, this data predated the new change for a different scoring system for SIRS, but essentially those children who had extreme tachycardia or tachypnea fell into this criteria. Of those 6,000, 80% needed no therapy and, seven, and, and virtually none of them came back. So these weren't missed illnesses. So it's a huge proportion of children are having extreme OBS and not being unwell. But more importantly, 76 of them ended up on ICU intubated despite having no derangement of their physiology at all. So we have an issue. So the child presents, and that through their general appearance or their physiological parameters, they may or may not be thought to be severely unwell or have sepsis. But that's only the first junction. There's a second junction after this. There's whether, once if you do have sepsis or not, whether you have a good outcome. 
Now, in the UK, we're having um, a big media campaign and a health campaign about the sepsis six. So these six criteria which were meant to deliver to all patients who have severe sepsis. And we can see that if you use sepsis six, you can direct those who are thought to have sepsis to have a better outcome. The problem is, is what acts to the children who aren't recognised to have to sepsis to give them an outcome as well. And that is a paradigm that I don't think we're fully evaluating or understanding. And actually, although I'm using the term sepsis, there is absolutely no reason to use the term ill. So generic, whether you've got respiratory disease, cardiovascular disease, gastrointestinal disease, what are we doing at both junctions to make sure that we understand how we pick up the most unwell children? And I'm afraid I haven't come here to talk to you today about special ways of doing that. So I'm not going to teach you a magic heart rate number or a respiratory rate number. What I want to talk about are the things that, that affect decision making. So if you work in a big emergency department, or even if you're a GP and you're seeing hundreds of patients, you have a high patient load. There are time pressures. Some of those are governmental standards, some of those are patient expectation, or some of those just because we, we believe in ourselves that we need to see patients as quickly as we possibly can. There are often in hospitals multiple handovers, and we have a, a challenge at the moment, particularly in the UK, where we don't think we have trained enough people at the right level with the correct paediatric expertise. And then there is diagnostic uncertainty, and none of us cope well with uncertainty. And we take all these things together, and they are the things that provide the challenge in just reaching junction A and junction B. So if there's a, 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 an effective spotting process, what we need to do is reduce knowledge deficit through training. We need to have an ability to get those patients to be seen by those who are the most experienced. We need to identify both tails of the distribution curve, and that's a bit flouncy, I should probably change that word. What I mean by that, it's not just a case of recognising the most sick. You would do better as well if you recognised the most well as soon as possible and just cleared them away because they don't need anything doing to them. And then you will reduce the haystack in which your little needles of sepsis or other disease are sitting. And then finally, we need to improve co communication because all of those things will decrease the cognitive load that is on the clinicians. So I'm gonna finish with a, a, a final thought. Um, we spend a lot of time looking for those magic features of heart rate, respiratory rate, special scoring systems that are going to help us pick out those most unwell children. This is a study from 1980. Okay, it's a bit outdated. It's pre-immunizations. The criteria for sickness were a bit odd. It didn't have many patients in it. There were only 312, but about 10% of them had serious illness. But in this scoring system, there's one thing that stood out for me is that no child who smiled had a serious illness. And it's one of the things that I want you to take away with you the next time you're looking at a child is not, is this patient sick, what do I need to do about it, is also, am I sure this patient's well and could they just go home? Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>